It gives me incredible joy to be part of this conversation. And in this conversation, I would love to propose a solution to the problems that we are facing right now. And in my opinion, the solution lies in the simple, elegant and often overlooked word resilience. By the end of this talk, I would love to leave you with just three thoughts. One that you as an individual, as a part of a team, as a part of an organization, as a part of this human race is far more resilient than you would give yourself credit for. I personally had to find this the harder way. Second is that resilience is a skill which means it is learnable, it is teachable. It doesn't matter that you're not born resilient. It doesn't matter that you're not race resilient. If you start right here, right now, through simple habits, through simple behavioral hacks and techniques, you are capable of creating resilience, not just in your mind, but also in your body, which we normally call immunity. The third being, what are the challenges that you might face when it comes to resilience? What are the areas that you would need to look into when it comes to resilience, not just for yourself, but also for your entire organization? One in three among us is facing a burnout. Nine out of 10 among us feel that this has been the most stressful year, the year where we had to have prolonged uncertainty, something that we are not really prepared for. This is the year that we have wondered what is it all about, whether we would even survive. Appallingly, the number that caught my attention was that 91% of us would rather talk to an automated bot about what we are going through rather than talk to an HR manager. Now that is a number I can corroborate with my personal experience as well as what I have been able to glean from my various conversations with CEOs, top management as well as middle management. So where does this all lead to? I would love to invite you to a personal glimpse into my life. So I started my career in brand consulting. I used to work in brand consulting, in advertising, in product design and had the opportunity to work in consumer behavior in market research and strategy, analyzing trends and analyzing things about human nature and how do we influence. Now, it was at the height of my career where I was juggling 11 countries all the way from Australia to India when I was doing work from home when it was not yet a necessity, definitely not even something that was acceptable in most companies that I had almost had a routine of how I could juggle it all at home. Thankfully, I was high functioning, so which meant that work was going great. But in my personal life, I realized I was not doing well. And this is when I realized that despite connecting with some of the finest therapists as well as doctors in Hong Kong, I was not doing fairly well. I would constantly want an answer to what could I do to make it better? The doctors and the therapists could talk to me and could prescribe medication, but none of them were empowering me. And this is how the journey really started. And thus, I started going into what I already knew, which is behavior and how it can be influenced. About connections between mind and body and how those interactions can change things for the better or worse. How we have beautiful psychosensory interactions in the sense what the senses tell us in terms of colors and scents and what we feel right here. When I was faced with all these problems in my life, the one meeting that I dreaded was to go talk to the HR manager about how I was feeling and how it might impact my work. The same goes on and on with every group and individual I meet, when I ask them the question of who is the last person you would want to talk this to, invariably it becomes the HR person. So in this HR summit, it is something of high relevance to think about this. One, that it is not going to change. Two, 
if we know that it is not going to change, should we go ahead and proactively step up as a manager and start giving solutions out there? The single thing that you can do to improve things is sleep. And one of the biggest casualties of pandemic has been our sleep cycles. Every individual I have coached or counseled has told me that they are finding it difficult to sleep. Now, sadly enough, whenever I take this to an HR person, they would tell me no one has actually approached me asking for a program on sleep. So beyond stress and sleep is a third one, which I call spark, which is a combination of motivation and happiness. Now, when we think about motivation, it is not about motivational speeches. It is about frameworks. How do I deal with setbacks? How do I learn from people who have converted ordinary lives into extraordinary? Are there frameworks, are there habits that we can imbibe in ourselves so that we can overcome the problem that we are facing? Likewise, when it comes to happiness, what does the science of happiness tell us? What are the hacks that we can do? Did you know that in a day you could go through five pleasant experiences and one short unpleasant experience, but at the end of the day, you would be stuck on that unpleasant experience. In order to be happier, you would need to create moments of gratitude or rather minutes of gratitude. This in turn, if practiced for few days, for few weeks, has impact, far-reaching impact even on your blood pressure. And when it comes to topics such as stress, such as sleep, such as uh, say motivation and happiness, it doesn't have to be the boring um, methods where we kind of, you know, almost fall asleep. Instead, it can be fun-filled interactive sessions where we all can participate. And considering most of us are working from home, can we bring in our family also to be part of this? Because end of the day, if we have to do this, we have to do this together. And I can assure you by simply having techniques to deal with stress, to have better quality of sleep and having a spark or rather rekindling your spark every day, you would be able to see far reaching consequences, not just as an individual, but also as a team and organization and as a country. So with these thoughts, I would love to leave you with one practice. And that would be releasing it out. So here is what I want you to do. Because when it comes to stress, there are three things that we need to look at and not just as stress alone. Stress management, according to me, is all about release, relaxation and restoration. Often we just go with just one part, which is stress management, which doesn't go into how does the body really, really let go of things. The fact is, the body has been built with mechanisms to release stress, with mechanisms to feel happier, with mechanisms to restore the damage that stress causes us. It is only when we work with the body, when we work with our breath, that we can achieve this. Did you know for every emotion, there is a different kind of a breathing? And by practicing that breathing, you can bring in that emotion. Did you know that there are movements that you do with your body which can shift you from feeling stressed to feeling exuberant? From feeling exuberant to feeling relaxed and calm? Did you know that there are stretches that you can do with your body which will immediately help you fall asleep? So these are thoughts I would want to leave you with. This year alone, I've had the opportunity to work with over 7,800 people across the globe. And we worked with techniques which have been tested out for these pandemic conditions. So even though I've been working in this field for over 10 years, this year I've been working on methods which will work under conditions where you have prolonged uncertainties. And with that, I've been able to support and help many to find health and happiness. Because ultimately all of us have been called to live with joy, peace and purpose.
So, thank you all for being part of this conversation and I hope together we can have a much better day, a brighter tomorrow. Thank you.